I think, you know, with, with all the wars that we've been in, people have a very different understanding of combat veterans now because we have technology, for one, you know. For two, we're actually making an effort to tell people our stories because they're important. Not because you want to you don't want to glorify violence or, or be graphic, but you, you have to paint the picture the way that it is, and that's the reality of it. I served in the Navy as a hospital corpsman. I was with 3rd Battalion, 1st Marines, Kilo Company, 2nd Platoon from 04 to 05, and then became a senior line corpsman after that. I met a paramedic when I was in high school. Just started talking about his job, working independently, being in medicine. Medicine seemed a viable option for me. It seemed like something challenging. I just thought it would be something that I wanted to try. So, and it was, it was a big push for me to be able to serve my country. Everybody where I come from, from New Mexico, uh, they generally tend to serve in the army. And I just kind of wanted to go a little further than that. My mom always supported me since I was younger and I was, a, I was an artistic kid, right? Uh, and she thought I would pursue the arts. And when I went the completely opposite way, I think it was more worry than anything. I'd never been in a war before. I was still very young in the Navy, but I, I knew there was going to be a huge response to that. There's no way that, it, that there couldn't be. It, people are different. Some people are adrenaline junkies. I'm not. I've never been an adrenaline junkie. But I, I, if, I'm, if I was going to serve, and I hadn't decided yet if this was going to be my lifelong career or if it was going to be something that I tried to put a lot of effort into and then get out and go to school. Because that's everybody's thing, right? Either get out and go to school or stay and make a career out of it. And I hadn't decided that. So with the time I had, I was trying to do as much as I could. Um, and I definitely got that, that opportunity. They asked for volunteers. The chief from 3-1 came over to 1-1. So you need about 45 corpsmen to go with the battalion. And I, I want to say he had about 11. And they were leaving in three months. And he came over and said, uh, I know it's a lot to ask. I know you just got back but we are no shit going to do the Battle of Fallujah. And I was just wondering if anybody would want to volunteer. And, you know, there's no time to debate or go over your decision. We were just looking at each other and seven of us raised our hands just like that. Monday morning we went to 3-1 and got divided. I kept thinking about it over and over again and I, I tried to look up parts of the city and, you know, it's a, it's a different time. It's 2004. I remember asking a bunch of the officers and I was trying to get a picture of the size of the city. Uh, and one of them, you know, said, well, think about like surrounding San Diego and walking into San Diego because we're near San Diego. And I, I said, mm, that's, that's, that's going to be a lot. You know, that's, that's going to be a lot. And it was. But there's all the stuff that nobody can prepare you for either, you know, because we hadn't done something like that. Uh, so there's, there's all the insurgency tricks you don't know about and you kind of learn as you, as you go. And it's weird to think about it now in retrospect because all the manuals and um, anything from close quarter combat to emergency medicine, all the stuff that we learned from that is literally just by going on the fly. We did the best with what we had, but it was, it was this, this underlying tone of like, we weren't ready. We weren't ready for what they were gonna throw at us. Which is weird because when you think of our response, Again, I've never been in another war, but we, we had everything you could throw at, throw at the enemy. You know, we had SEALs and Blackhawks and army support. Because you are talking again about an area where people have been at war way longer than us. Uh, and that's a very methodical type of mindset that's created, so. We would go by mosques and our interpreter would be listening and the Imam would be talking about casting us out of the lands and over the loudspeaker, you know, and then they would break and come out and we would be right there. The same people who would greet you. And it's, it's not that easy of an answer, right? 
you treat locals, you see infections, you see abuse, but you also see people who are turned into human bombs, you know, kids, just stuff you're not, you're not prepared for. Nobody could teach you that before you step in there. Because what nobody tells you is they will use any means necessary to kill you. And it's all in the name of faith, which is really overwhelming. Track gate dropped. We went out. I remember visibility wasn't great. There was smoke everywhere. We stacked up, we started moving. Maybe, and it couldn't have been an hour in the first time I peeked around the corner and somebody took a shot at me and I said, oh, this is, this is real, <laughs> you know, this is real. And um, we had a, a Abrams tank at, 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 attached to us. And uh, I remember John Jacobs running to the back, picking up the phone, turning the can and just taking out the whole house. This is our first day, it's day one, you know, and I, uh, I don't remember sleeping. I, I remember like just going, you know, going, going, going. Uh, and I, I tried to piece it together as I went by. I tried to like make notes and write stuff down. And I, I just, you're just very on edge the entire time. A lot of people you can't see who's trying to who's trying to kill you. It's just wings and zings like flying by you, and you just keep running. Uh, I don't know. It's it's all these memories that are layered on top of each other. It's like a like a film reel, and it just goes all the time. It's it's weird. Out of the thirty three lost right in the battalion, I had three. One was my company. One was weapons. One was h &S. But I don't remember who the first person that I treated was, because there were, there were so many. And I, the thing, the thing that I go back to is my med bag. Uh, in the first 12 hours, I was running out of supplies. Because I remember tearing up clothes to try and do compression bandages. Uh, I had no morphine. I remember that. So like we couldn't resupply. Um, I had to wait till I took somebody back and then I would try to get stuff and then come right back into the city. But I, I don't remember who the first person I treated was. I remember a Marine getting shot on the side of the head, went into his Kevlar, wrapped around, came out the other side. One in a million. Brad Castle. <clears throat> the most, probably the scariest moment in my life is with him and Staff Sergeant Chambers. There's no room in the vehicle. So they're both laying down. Castle has an IV, I have, I have, his, I have his IV. I'm standing between them, I can't kneel down. And there's still a guy upstairs. There's still an insertion upstairs. I'm holding the IV bag and I have I have the weapon. I'm looking I'm looking through the ACOG at the second floor and I can see his his the top of his wrap. And in the moment, I'm I'm like, man, if, if this guy peeks over, if he sees us, all he has to do is angle down and spray fish in a barrel. And it was just one in a million. The guy never looked. All he had to do was peek over, and he never looked. And as we drove away, I just happened to look back when the house exploded and we just went everywhere. And I, surreal moments, that, that guy still crawled out of the rubble and threw a grenade at the Marines, like, I don't know. My platoon was in a house fighting with an adjacent house. And uh, Strader had gotten shot so they're, they're calling me to try to get over to him, but I can't because um, they're trying to shoot me before I get to the building. So they give me cover fire, Max, and um, I wanna say the Battalion XO took a rocket out of a vehicle. Like I just, he took an AT4 out of the vehicle and just started laying them down uh, into, the, into the house and it gave me time to run to the building. 
Margo was there and he was hit. Uh, and I do my assessment, you know, I'm, I'm going, I just disconnect, I go into my job, I start doing my assessment. He's awake, you know, and that's, like I said, there's things that, you know, you can't control, you can't do anything about. And when I'm there, <clears throat> Boswood calls my name and I just happen to turn. Somebody shoots at me through the window. The round goes by my eye and I just jump on top of Morgan. Uh, they start shooting at us and I just, I'm just talking to him, you know, cause he's looking at me and I say, I'm, I'm right here, I'm not going anywhere, I'm right here. And he fades and we, uh, we take him down, we carry him out to the vehicle and uh, <clears throat> There is your logical brain when it comes to, you know, any type of traumatic medicine or emergency medicine. There's what you look at and you know, you know, but I would also want somebody to do everything they could for me. So I do CPR on him the entire way back. They take him away from me. I don't want to let them take him away from me. I'm just losing my shit. I was outside and I was just, I was just trying to get a moment and I couldn't stop shaking. <clears throat> and there's an insurgent at the surgical station, he's outside, he's been shot in the stomach. <clears throat> There's a guard on him. Cause this just happened, right? It was the first time in my life where I really felt like I might be able to kill someone with my hands. And I I remember I was shaking so bad. I went up to the I went up to the to the kid, to the to to the insurgent. I had the Marine stand down and back away from me. And I took I used to keep my K bar on my chest. I took my K bar out. And I leaned down and I was I was wasn't looking at the kid in the eyes and I remember I looked at his eyes and he was just he was just terrified. And I asked him to give me his hand. And I undid the the tape from his hand because the IV was wrong, it was kinked. <clears throat> and I readjusted it, I retaped it, and he, he told me thank you. And I couldn't look at him, I just couldn't look at him, and I said, You're welcome. And I stood up, <clears throat> you know, cause the entire time I just keep thinking like, it is your choice whether you adhere, you adhere to your ethos or you don't. Help everyone, that's your job, that's your oath. But that was, that was probably aside from losing a member of my family. Like that's, <clears throat> yeah, that's one of my hardest days I would say. There's a strong guilt factor, you know, for a lot of people, there's survivors, survival, survivor's guilt. There's all of these things that come into play, but um, at the end of the day, you, know, you just have to learn how to understand that a lot of it is out of your control. It's a hard acceptance is what I was saying. It's why so many people have a hard time when they get out, right? So I, if you consider that we've lost more people to suicide since being home than we did in the war, that's astonishing to me. Um, but I think what people don't consider is a lot of us who come home, if we come from a rural place, we say, well, we'll just go back home and be around family. But over time, you understand that not a lot of people can understand where you're coming from. And so it's very isolating. Uh, I prepared for a year before I retired, a year. I had to slowly give everything back and prepare myself and take every, thing the Navy offered me to be able to become not a sailor. <laughs> when I retired, I was planning to actually go to med school, but I retired at 38. Uh, I'd had, well, surgery, I'd already had back surgery. I, I had a section of my leg replaced. And I was like, no, I don't, I don't want to do this. I'm, I'm good. So what I'm, what I'm focusing on is the part for that I see that's lacking, right? There's PTSD, but then there's grief. And um, literature and review and, and research doesn't exist for grief in combat vets. It's not a thing that's been studied. My path has changed a little bit, um, but it's still, it is still very much centered around trying to help people in the way that I can. 
not everybody can work with the terminally ill or with the dying. It's not that it's any easier for me, but I find, I find that it's good work to be able to help somebody to die properly versus to die alone or, you know, to die forgotten. So I got into hospice. Uh, and so it's, uh, it's kind of given me a new path. It changed all, it changes all the time, but it changed again, so. There are all the things outside of your control, but there is your ability, your hands, your adaptability, your, your drive to want to help somebody else. It's a very, it's a very base skill, you know, but if you take it and you, and you just put everything into it, you, I'm, I'm blown away by a lot of the things that we did because it's, it's, it's the worst thing I could have ever imagined. And I saw my, my Marines and my corpsmen do incredible, incredible things.